Okay. So yeah, I, um, I was, I, I posted just a little while ago on my Instagram stories, <laughs> and I just said this to Lana and I said, you know, I watched the whole film all the way through just now, right before the interview. Okay. Um, I had watched a good portion of it already, but I hadn't finished it. And so I decided I'm going to go back and see if the beginning does the same thing. Is this a sustainable beginning or is this just something that got me all, you know, hype in, um, and it's like a one-time thing, right? And so uh, when I started the film, I was like, oh my God, that, that the opening, it's the opening. It's the way that um, the film starts with the, the spoken word, with the cinematography. It's something I notice immediately. And while I'm not like, uh, I'm not, studied or technical about cinematography, um, I know it. I know it when I see it. I know good cinematography when I see it. And I was, I was um, very impressed by the opening of the film. And so I think that the questions that I have I, were like sort of uh, came together as one big question that I think will pretty much get the conversation started and it's going to keep that conversation going. Um, and that, and that question is just like, you, was this intentional in terms of um, deciding that you were going to document this experience um, within the community? Because this is, this is such a collective like uh, enlightenment moment. Like everybody is uniting and coming together uh, around this thing. So, either was this intentional you were like oh we're going to document this moment we need to make sure that we have records of this type of thing or did it just come together and if it did just come together how how did you do this how did this how did how did you do it <laughs> well great well um thank you for your reflection on the film and it's great to hear how you know the opening grabbed you <laughs> and i have to um just, I, I love to give credit to the people who are kind of behind those Im early impressions that you might have gotten. Destiny Muhammad is the uh, spoken word artist who opens the film. And uh, Demandre Ward, a lot of his cinematography is really featured in that beginning um, see, uh, scene. Um, in terms of the kind of looking back at the origin to the story, um, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I knew that there was a mural that was planned uh, for a particular intersection and the muralists I knew kind of in passing um, and through a conversation uh, they asked if I would be able to help learn kind of the, the, the community's history that would go onto the walls. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was kind of brought in as more of a, a support to figure out what the material would be, what the, Im the visuals would be on the, on the walls for the mural to start. Um, and so the larger story kind of that bubbled up from the mural, but also the surrounding area and the tr uh, transformation and change uh, occurring in downtown Oakland was really just um, happening and we had the camera out and so we followed those stories uh, as best as we could. Um, but I happened to be uh, living on Alice Street um, when uh, the, I heard about this mural uh, being planned, which was two blocks you know, down from my, my uh, apartment. So I would walk down those two blocks and uh, meet with the muralists and talk about the walls and, and then began doing interviews with all of these community members to understand um, the, the very diverse uh, communities that exist on this one intersection, al along with kind of the shared um, narratives between those communities. And yeah. we just kind of kept following the story. Over six years, I have to also say, was it the five, a six year process to get to, to now? Yeah, so we had, we had um, for Community Rejuvenation Project, which is the organization that did the mural, we had planned a community engagement process based on the conception of the mural, which was literally the intersection of Alice and 14th Street in downtown Oakland. And the two communities that 
represented that intersection. One was the uh, Chinese American and Chinese community based around the Hotel Oakland. And the other was the Afro diasporic community based out of the Malanga Cascalor Center for the Arts. And these were two communities that had a lot of shared history of resilience, but didn't really interact uh, prior to the mural being done and the, um, uh, the community uh, uh, block party that we had at the, at the completion of the mural. Uh, but we knew that they both existed and that they both had shared history. So we set up this community engagement process. We asked Spencer to come in and document the history, you know, get some, help us understand the context, the cultural context of who needed to be on the wall, but then it kind of evolved from there. So even though it was planned, there were a lot of organic aspects as the process continued. Yeah, I just found that with the, um, the Community Rejuvenation Project, first of all, um, the first thing that struck me about the project being named this Community uh, Rejuvenation Project was that um, the gentleman who had just spoken right before the uh, CRP was mentioned talked about moving there from Chicago and um, coming there and feeling intimidated by the murals he already had seen. And also feeling this energy around rising to the occasion, this excitement and how these murals in Oakland, even in the, the form in, the, in which that they already were, they were so powerful that they inspired him to be better. And now he's on this documentary talking about his history, um, having been from Chicago, but being Oakland based. And so um, I wonder, Eric, like, what do you, in terms of the other things, the layers of things that this project has inspired, had you noticed any type of spiritual, uh, again, enlightening type of shift in your community? It seems like that, but I'm just wondering if that's something that you notice and, um, you know, just, just especially because how powerful it is to just shift a perspective and to shift mm -hmm. one that's like brave. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's an interesting question. I think that the mural kind of highlighted the spirituality that was already present in the community. I mean, it was literally a reflection of these cultural efforts going back to the very beginning, the founding of Oakland. I mean, we have, uh, you know, uh, we had images of the first Chinatown of the uh, some Chinese laborers from the, the 19th century. Uh, we had the Black Panther struggle. We have the cultural practitioners of the Malanka Center, uh, the African American dance, or African dance actually, that uh, you know was started by Catherine Dunham and then uh, continued with Malanga Castellord and Halifu Osumare and. These are all very uh, spiritual people and Malanga himself, Malanga Cascalor himself. And these are all very spiritual people who do spiritual cultural practices. I mean, you could even say that the calligrapher uh, at the, uh, the Hotel Oakland, that uh, traditional Chinese calligraphy is a spiritual practice. So I don't really think that the mural created any spirituality that wasn't already there but it did create a platform to highlight that as the spirituality as part of the overall contribution, the cultural contribution that these communities have made to Oakland. Well, if I can add to that, um, I mean, I think it's important, you know, to acknowledge too that in these two communities, there has been, you know, some historical tension, you know, um, as, as, you know, communities of color are often kind of divided and pitted against each other um, when we have dwindling resources in cities, right? Um, so I think the mural, you know, and art in general, right, can really bring communities together in a way that 
you know, especially Asian Americans, but, you know, all, all people of color, we don't see ourselves reflected in our city. We don't see ourselves reflected in the media and images, right, and narrative and storytelling, that when we see ourselves on a wall, it's actually very meaningful because that doesn't happen very often. And of course, it's part of this place keeping and, and trying to, you know, keep our cultural districts and, and the history of it there. Um, and so I think, you know, the process of it, you know, Community Rejuvenation Project just did an amazing job really bringing the communities together, doing that education, using the art and the mural as a process of community building, right, between two communities that don't, yeah, always talk to each other and don't always understand each other. Um, and so in, in that way, I think it did shift some of the spirit. And then in the, in the sense that seeing ourselves and seeing our spirit reflected in a time um, where that culture is being threatened by displacement and gentrification, I think uplifts the spirit in a way that sometimes we don't know our power until we see it and until we see it visualized through art sometimes that, um, you know, passing by that mural every day on the way to work, like it uplifted me and it empowered me, you know, even before the struggle around the mural and the, the development that went in that place. Um, so that we became invested in the mural. And then the minute that it was threatened, that's when we sprung to action. Yeah. Just the, the idea that, um, you know, art is so many things, like you said, uh, art is education and art as education, as inspiration, it is something that can move mountains. When you talk about like having, in, in, in various religious texts, they talk about having the faith of the must succeed how small it is just for you to believe in something and, and how powerful that small is. Um, Adrienne Marie Brown um, in Emergent Strategy talked about small as all, right? And so um, it, it was powerful because the spiritual aspect came across to me and I've never heard of Alice Street or this project. Um, and I think that that is really powerful. Um, because I feel like I've been a part of this process for the six years that it's been a project. And that's how powerful this film is. And to me, the only thing that could create this type of energy. Um, and I think it may have, been, may have been Eric that said it. This is, this is, this, this is a, a marker for energy, right? And um, for me to feel it as a first time having heard of it is powerful and so I um I just wonder how each of you have gone from one aspect of your spirituality whatever that is to another aspect because I don't doubt that there was a transition go ahead yeah, <laughs> Kind of a hard question to answer. I mean, for me, um, again, I, I actually, um, I live right behind the Malonka Center uh, on Jackson Street. So every Sunday when uh, Kiazi Malonga has his drumming classes, the drums will go on for like, you know, four to six hours at a time and I can hear them out my window. And to me, um, that allows me to actually feel connected uh, to, uh, to ancestral connections, you know, and hearing the drums, it's like, it, it, it's very soothing uh, to me uh, on a spiritual level because, I mean, you know, here we are in an urban environment. I'm in the middle of a, you know, major American city. And what is my connection to my ancestral culture? Where do I access that? I access it through places like the Malanga Center and knowing that they have cultural activities allows me to kind of have an everyday spirituality as opposed to, oh, well, I can only be spiritual on Sundays or on special occasions. It's more like, no, it's part of, you know, my everyday reality, my everyday being is that I'm able to carry this with me and just being able to reaffirm the connection to the ancestors. For me, that's what the mural did. I think for the uh, people at the Malanka Center, it was an affirmation and, a, and an acknowledgement of what they actually have contributed to Oakland culture, which hasn't always been highlighted. Absolutely. 
anybody else want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I owe, um, I actually owe Spencer and Eric and CRP um, a lot of credit for helping me kind of reground in my own family's history, which has absolutely kind of changed my um, connection to the land, uh, my, con my connection to my own history. Um, because in, at this time in my process, um, I, you know, my family came to Oakland Chinatown in 1906, and uh, it was actually Eric who, who helped me, um, who gave me an assignment that, that made me explore the Chinese Exclusion Act and uh, my history and how um, really my family had been impacted by the Chinese Exclusion Act by, um, you know, kind of the, you know, segregation and redlining laws that forced, you know, our communities to live in, you know, cultural ghettos like Chinatown. Um, and then really rooting down in, you know, this question of why do we need cultural districts? Um, you know, where is home? What is belonging? Um, and so kind of all, it all just kind of happened around this time when, you know, we were doing the marches and we were doing, you know, the organizing around our neighborhoods and around these community benefits agreements um, that this was actually like a very deep spiritual process for me to to claim, you know, who I am as an Oaklander, who I am as a Californian, um, being part of this ba the Bay Area history for, you know, over, you know, 100 years. Um, claiming that, you know, because I'd always said, you know, I was born and raised in Oakland, but then when I really learned about my history in, in this neighborhood, you know, I really felt this much deeper power kind of coming from the ancestors of like, no, you have to defend this because it's important and this is why. And, and you know, when we, you know, face the detractors at planning commission meetings or city council who said, oh, these are just parking lots. Like, why are you fighting over parking lots? We were like, no, these are our neighborhoods. This is our belonging. This is our family. This is life to us because we thrive off of being part of a community. And, you know, when people are forced out of their communities, they often, our elders often pass away because, you know, communities like the Hotel Oakland and, and Chinatown and, you know, yeah, the Black Arts District, this is where we actually get our purpose to live. Um, and so kind of, you know, becoming part of this movement to defend um, what's so beautiful about Oakland and about our communities um, really transformed my life. Wow. Um, so great to hear from both Eric and Leilan on this question. And I don't think we've maybe talked in these terms before. So a lot of this is, you know, really nice for me to hear. Um, and I think, you know, uh, back to your question about um, this project has completely transformed, you know, me and my understanding of, um, you know, uh, the role I can play in a, in, in, you know, an activist pro project and, and the, the role I can play as a documentarian. Um, I think has been in some respects a spiritual um, experience and a, um, I think, you know, when you start um, trying to tell a story or help others to tell their story, um, there's a level of trust. You are both kind of giving each other in, the, in, that, in, that, in that process, you know, the teller of the story and the listener. Um, there's a, um, there's a relationship that's that develops and then the the idea of um you know you don't really know where a story is going to go and there's so many times where you could just kind of you know put it down and, and move on to something else and i think the 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 faith required in some respects of um going through to the end um to see what happens and um continue to show up um is in some respects kind of an everyday, you know, spiritual decision of, okay, I'm gonna, you know, go back and continue um, showing up and who's, who, who have I not heard from, whose voice is really critical, um, you know, and, 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 and the sense of, you know, when the mural was going to be covered up, which, you know, is part of a plot uh, line in the film, um, there was a real kind of sense of like, well, maybe this is, oh, it maybe this is it maybe this is over and I, I think I was really buoyed and lifted up by the community and the community's response and the community's commi commitment to say no you know we we want 
our community to be reflected in, in our neighborhood. And we want to be um, sitting at the table with developers and making decisions together. We, we can't be left out of this conversation. I think I was lifted up con continuously by the resilience of the community of Oakland and in particular at this, this intersection. And that, that's had a lasting um, impression on me and has definitely transformed me in that way. Yeah, this is incredible. Eric, just more or? Just more uh, transformation? Well, you know, I, I mean, I think it's an, it, important to incorporate spirituality into our everyday lives and not look at, look at it as something that doesn't already emanate from within us. And I think that when we see projects like this, when we see the that mural, it, it was a acknowledgement of that. And, you know, particularly for being a quote unquote minority, even though if I look at the demographics, people of color are the majority of Oakland's population. It's one of the most diverse cities in the entire country. And, you know, if I do the numbers, it's like still more than 70% people of color, even with the displacement that's happened. Um, but, you know, to build on what Leilan was talking about, this led to the this entire process of we had a community march to the planning commission to file paperwork for an appeal. We bought, brought drums into the city building. It was probably the first time they've ever heard live drumming, like yeah. in their face, like reverberating through these halls where, you know, probably 80 years ago, they were, uh, they were making redlining documents. Um, and then it didn't stop there. We went ahead and actually started negotiating community benefit agreements um, with developers. And I think that we were so energized by this movement that it gave us the strength to do that. I mean, I had never done that before. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but we just kind of, you know, maybe, maybe spirit guided my hand, maybe the ancestors were with me on that one. And we were able to uh, successfully negotiate uh, community benefit agreements worth more than $20 million, including affordable housing downtown. And I remember Leilan in the meeting uh, with the developer and just insisting that it was possible for them to build on-site affordable housing. And that affordable housing tripled the amount of affordable housing in the downtown pipeline, just one development. And all of that goes back to this mural and the acknowledgement of what you're calling spirituality. Yeah. I just, I, the, so many spiritual aspects of it, unifying um, Asian American communities and Black American communities which is which is powerful everything is powerful within itself so that happened um in terms of uh, one of the gentlemen in the in the film said that you know he doesn't make a lot of money but he's happy and that really for him is what what's important his daughter inspires him his wife inspires him so that aspect of um being being proud of yourself that self-love that all the things that we're that coming home to ourselves right and then, um, you know, highlighting the things that kind of hold up the earth, like everything that was going on at the Malanga, um, all the programming and how people were dancing and dancing their way to City Hall because this is the way to practice the culture and all people wanted to do was to be able to have the space, physical and spiritual to practice culture. And that does translate into art and that becomes an education, it becomes inspirational. So I keep thinking about all these different things that hit me. And I wonder, um, just in terms of the commentary that you heard from Jane Doe, um, knowing and being so secure in what, what, what you believe were possible, right? Um, to hear this woman talk about the project and the way that she did, um, I wonder what your thoughts are uh, surrounding that and how did that challenge all your positive aspirations? How did, how did that challenge? Did it challenge You're it? talking about the woman that wrote all those letters? She wrote the letters. <laughs> she said something about um, 
she felt like this was a lot of uh, simple minded or mindless protest. Um, and that she preferred dogs and dog walkers be in the mural. And so we, we, I was watching this um, film with my partner and I, and we said, and, and it was said, um, is that a new code? Is that code for white people? And um, you know, the fact that this woman would feel it important to interject that there should be dogs and dog walkers represented and otherwise this mural doesn't represent the neighborhood. Yeah, well, <laughs> You know, she was, um, she almost was like a comedy um, aspect, almost like a humorous aspect. Um, and, and, you know, and in real life, like we would encounter her like walking down the street and she'd just be kind of like going on her way, like da 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 da. You know, we would kind of like go say, hey, what's up and exchange pleasantries. But at the same time, she was writing a letter to every city official that she could every week complaining about the presence of black people and people of color on that wall. And it's really interesting to interact with someone that really represents this kind of blind racism where they are so, 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 so racist, but they don't understand that they are racist. They don't understand from my perspective or from Leilan's perspective or from Spencer's perspective, the optics of what they are saying. And they have full conviction that what they are saying is the right thing. Yeah, so I thought she added something to the, to, to the film um, in terms of it's good to also have that point of view and that perspective. Yeah. I was just going to parallel it with what it sounds like, you know, the, I think it's similar to the, <clears throat> the mindset of white lives matter, you know, that, that these are people who don't understand the history um, of our city, the racial dynamics of the city and why people have felt uh, left out for so long, you know, it's interesting looking at, you know, the history of this neighborhood where, you know, there, there used to be white people um, before white flight, right, in the 1950s and 60s, they all left because they saw the Black Panther Party, they saw people of color rising up in their power, and they went to the suburbs, they went to Walnut Creek and other places um, to get away from communities of color and left cities disinvested, um, struggling for decades decades and decades on our own to rebuild our own city. Um, and so it's, it's fascinating to see an elder like that who, you know, I assume had been there for a while. I don't, I don't know, Spencer, if we know how long, or, or Eric, how long she had lived there. Um, but to be so narrow-minded and, um, you know, kind of tunnel vision in, in, you know, understanding the context of the city and our history. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just add um, both of what was said there was um, was right on point. Uh, just add that I think she has been a resident of Alice Street for a long time, uh, much too long to have kind of the uh, the opinions that she'd formed around um, what kind of material should was appropriate or not appropriate for the wall. But she was a major thorn in the side of the project. As Eric said, she wrote so many letters. She was at every city council meeting. She wrote letters to the editor, um, you know, really complaining about the content of the mural, um, which, you know, one of the only real um, object, objective voices, um, but a very amplified one. She's a lawyer by training, so she had, you know, the legalese information, you know, to back, backing her up. And, um, and at times, it, you know, we had to have special meetings with the city and, uh, or the muralist did have to have, you know, ongoing meetings to kind of uh, figure out how to, how to move through it. Um, but, you know, I think what, what Leilan brought up too is that this is the, the danger of what gentrification can mean in a community is when you have people so disconnected from what was the important cultural aspects and the, the, the vibrant and diverse history of a community. When you have new people coming in who kind of disregard that whole history of what was there before um, and then push their own agenda and you find instances like this where you know um, it put put at threat not only the the mural which is you know important but the the Malanga Center itself is under threat 
by, you know, people from outside the community complaining about the noise from the drums, you know, and, um, and you find these very important in, uh, institutions that, that have to kind of fight against newcomers not regarding the, the history of the community in which they land, you know. Um, and white people in general, I mean, not, not to mention Jerry Brown trying to take over the building for his charter school, you know, and, and Carla and others having to fight back against that. Yeah, people not understanding the significance of, of the, our culture and our history. I mean, just, just the idea that, uh, honestly, when we think about like, what we're seeing in, in, the, in the film and what, what people term as urban, you know, that's been a, you know, a, a euphemism for derog a derogatory term um, for a while. But when we think about um, just the fact that people and, and whiteness, the, the, the idea of whiteness is attracted to this as an aesthetic. We're talking about art here. So this is attracted to what urban and urbanism is as an aesthetic. And so much so that they feel like they have to own it and then whitewash it. Even though it's the thing that attracted them, it's the thing that's kind of mm -hmm. holding up the globe, right? Yeah. And so I wonder, <clears throat> that, that, that's where all my spiritual questions are coming from because let's be real, urban neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color, black people's neighborhoods, they are, there's an aesthetic associated with this and it is a, a, an attractive aesthetic. And I don't think we've heard people talk about that before. It's an attractive aesthetic to whiteness. Um, and it's, it's, just, it's just crazy uh, because we are oftentimes expected to just kind of lay down and let it happen. So I mm -hmm. wonder if there were thoughts like that that, um, that, that, that you feel are super unique. Because I felt like, I'm like, wow, I thought about this in a way that was unique to me. I had never thought about this before in this way. This helped me think about it in this new, unique way for me. I wonder if, that, if anybody else has um, thoughts like that about the film when you play it back. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, it came up in, in planning commission meetings and city council meetings. You know, I think Eric said it more than once that, you know, this, the, these, these neighborhoods, this, these cultural districts that you're trying, that you're displacing and gentrifying are exactly why so many people want to pay $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 for an apartment to live in Oakland and why they're coming back from the suburbs after that white flight, right? Because they are bored of suburbs being devoid of culture <laughs> and whitewashed, you know? And so they're coming back to these cities, yeah, for that color. And, and we know as Oakland, because we've seen it across the Bay in San Francisco, everyone flocked to San Francisco go for the culture, for the vibrancy, for the artists, and then they displaced and killed it all so that they were forced to, refugees came over to Oakland, you know, we have many artists from San Francisco who had to come over here. And so we've seen it before. And so we knew that we had to stake, put our stake in the ground and say, no, we're not going to let that happen in Oakland. Like Oakland, you know, and, and our communities and our artists here are too beautiful um, to let that happen here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that cultural preservation, when you really unpack it, uh, you can really make a very strong argument for it. And it's just like what Leilam said, where they did surveys of people, new residents that just moved to Oakland and asked them what they valued the most. And they said diversity. Well, okay, but mm -hmm. you're diluting the diversity just by moving here. So the least that you can do is understand the history of the neighborhood that you're moving into. And, you know, since we did this project, uh, since we uh, completed this, this film, we've moved ahead with uh, cultural preservation initiatives on all these projects uh, in Oakland. Uh, and I always look at the Alice Street Mural, the Universal Language Mural, as a model for that. And, you know, because some of this is just in theory and it's just policy and recommendations, but where's the implementation? And this is a very strong implementation of what the power of public art can do. I mean, we just saw it with the George Floyd murals, uh, not only in Durham, uh, but in Oakland and in other cities where all this beautiful art came out of this struggle and this protest and this pain. 
and you know it's it's but it's not just pain there's also joy uh joy. wrapped up in it you know and so w when we say that black lives matter you know we're not saying that other lives don't matter we're saying that if you honor a black life it basically creates a more equitable society for everyone y'all benefit yeah yeah anybody else want to talk about that Oh, I think it's so important topic to, to bring up around how uh, communities are shifting and changing. And, you know, as, as a white person too, you know, um, and in working on a project like this, um, I had to really make sure that, you know, my biases weren't, um, you know, entering into the storytelling. And, you know, every time you kind of pick up a camera and um, have, I think I alluded it to it earlier, it's you're creating a relationship with the people you interview, um, you're developing a, a level of trust to tell story. But at the same time, it's so important to get a, a very diverse uh, group of production team to um, give, it, give advice on story um, to, to ensure that, you know, you're not um, creating biases or kind of romanticizing um, from somebody for who I didn't grow up in Oakland. Um, I've lived there for almost 20 years, so I have some experience, but uh, here. Um, but there, I think in the storytelling aspect, it's so important to always kind of evaluate, um, you know, what, what's your, your motivations um, and what are the power dynamics with holding a camera and telling a story. Um, so I bring that up because I think it is kind of this, uh, it's a bigger question around documentarians in, in general and, and how you tell stories that you ensure that you bring a diverse cadre of uh, production team and make sure and do, you know, screenings and get feedback and look at your, you know, subjects and make sure that everyone's kind of on board with, with how you, the angle of the story and make sure that they feel that it's the right story being told. Um, so just kind of like um, pulling back the curtain to talk about that element of uh, storytelling, I think it's it's kind of a critical critical piece. I, I was curious about what you had to say because Eric kind of touched on my next question, so I was trying to make sure I gave this a space. And uh, wow, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. So, and 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 this just goes right along with the question, which is. Um, Obviously, this is a model, and maybe there was some intention, you know, for this to be a model, and and maybe there there wasn't, which is you know any good thing you know created is 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 there's something you know and everything about your life is intentional, so everything's going to be dope. Um, but so this is a model. Do you think that this model should be replicated all over the country? Oh, and absolutely. Oh. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. I mean, I mean and you probably want to uh, want me to unpack that. Um, so, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is that America is getting more diverse. And by 2050, it will be majority people of color. Uh, and so we have to understand that these are population trends that are also driving cultural trends. Uh, and diversity is the future of America if it wasn't the past. Uh, and so we're all informed and in, in, enriched by uh, proximity and interaction with other cultures. I mean, we cannot say that people who are xenophobic are the most um, enlightened and elevated people in the, you know, because they haven't really been exposed to other cultures. They're afraid of other cultures. They don't know that, well, you know, other people like to dance, they like to sing, they like to, you know, walk down the street. Like, it's not really that different. We're all human. Uh, but when, when you have a solid model that upholds cultural diversity and upholds, um, I would even go so far as to say cultural equity, um, it really becomes like, wow, this is something that upholds the, 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 the values of a community. And it gives me a, a, a sense of place and a sense of identity. And not only that, it makes that place a destination where this is somewhere I want to go. 
And I mean, uh, you know, Leilan talked about walking past the mural every day, uh, you know, to go to work. Uh, I mean, I did that too. I, I, I lived one block from the mural and I was always going down 14th and up 14th and always passing by the mural. And it was like, you know, for the, the time that it was there, it was like an old friend, you know, it made me feel more comfortable in my own city. So yeah, if that can happen in other cities, um, you know, besides all the benefits of public art and what they do as far as creative placekeeping and positive mental health benefits and all of that, um, the main thing is that they make people feel more comfortable and impart a sense of belonging. So yeah, absolutely, that should be everywhere on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, you know, I think this was actually really a perfect storm and you have to understand the history and uh, the recent history of Oakland was that, you know, we were ravaged by the foreclosure uh, crisis and displacement. We had, you know, over 10,000 families displaced um, in a span of just a couple of years, you know, families who had owned their homes for 30, you know, 40 years and um, were just kicked out, you know, overnight. Um, and, you know, I was working on that for a few years and so, you know, we were hit like a one-two punch. It was foreclosure crisis and then it was a displacement crisis because right after the first closure crisis, you know, that's when everybody wanted to come back to the cities and then that's when the rents just shot up like crazy and all this new development was happening. Um, so, you know, and that's happening in, in a lot of cities across the country, right? So um, that perfect storm, you know, it, it, it um, is it is happening in many cities because of kind of globalization and what's happening with our cities and people coming back to the cities, right? So I got a chance to actually travel around the country and work for an uh, organization called National Capacity that looked at displacement in 10 major regions across the U.S. And I was able to see, yeah, this isn't, you know, obviously just happening in Oakland. This is happening in all of our U.S. major cities and, and cities around the world, right? Um, and, and I think an important thing kind of to bring back you know, one of the conversations from earlier is that, you know, the narrative is that, you know, at first was like gentrification is inevitable. We can't stop it. You know, it's a hopeless, you know, it's hopeless to try to fight it. And what I learned from traveling to ten, these 10 regions across the country is that, no, there's actually really progressive policies that you can put into place, you know, including affordable housing and inclusionary housing, right? Um, but there are dozens and, you know, probably hundreds of policies that cities, states, regions, counties can put into place if they have the political will to do so, right? Um, so that's what I learned when I was doing that national organizing and, and brought it back to Oakland to, to help people understand that in other cities, you know, like Boston or, you know, the Twin Cities or Seattle, they, people were asking for these things and that we shouldn't be afraid to ask to be part of our own community and our own neighborhood and this new development happening, right? And, and the developers tried to make us, you know, you know seem greedy right for asking to be part of these developments for asking for community benefits right but but I knew that you know this was the norm in other places and so I think that that you know countering that hopelessness and giving people a sense of power within that process right you know our city of Oakland has been leaving communities of color out low, low income families um, flatland families for so long out of planning processes and I think that was also part of the perfect storm was that you know we were just sick and tired of it um, there's no democratic process it's not a progressive planning process and I think our, our efforts and our organizing has shifted that and changed that in the city of Oakland so now they they know that we're going to show up if they do this again um, but I think it's about shifting the, the sense of do we have the power to stop this? And I think that's what can change in every city is for people to see their own power and to demand it and to fight it and to defend what is ours and what are our communities and our neighborhoods. So absolutely, that needs to happen across the country and across the world. It's a theme that we're the ones we've been waiting for. And that's certainly something that I would want. I want the blueprint. I'm just, I'm just saying. Spencer. Oh, um, well, what's already been said again, um, what else could I say? I think that, um, you know, the two muralists, Desi and Poncho, when they approach this project, they approach the mural from a very deep uh, community engagement. And that doesn't always happen with a lot of public art, you know, right. in, our, in our big cities. Um, and as Eric was also part of that process in doing this deep community research, 
um, bringing me along to kind of learn the community stories. That was a lot of investment of, I mean, it was a couple of years before any paint went on the wall. And not every mural has that kind of um, approach. So if there's anything, I think that model of uh, community engagement and having meetings with, uh, you know, diverse communities to come up with the right material to go on the wall was very critical. Um, and then I think too, um, there was an approach from the, from the outset that said the, the message on this wall is about resilience and is about combating gentrification. And so that was already the, um, the intention was put into the material. Um, and there was early conversations about, you know, I wonder if this can help stop this, this parking lot from being developed. You know, would the community rise up if, if they felt a sense of connection to what was on the walls? Now, if, if there wasn't a mural there, I don't know if there would have been the same community um, rising up to fight that development and to fight for community development um, benefits, um, community benefit agreements. But um, something happened with the intention of public art, the type of material that went up, the communities that were already, as Leilan was mentioning, politically um, engaged in, in, in fighting for, you know, seat at the table uh, with developers and city planners. So it was a perfect storm. And also I think there is something to be said around what, what the intention you put into your art, the community engagement process that you, you, you take in doing that, and then how the power of art to bring people together. Um, there is something there I think that, you know, we've talked about it's like uh, Alice Street is, you know, one street, but I think every community, every city around the country has its Alice Street. Mm -hmm. and has its, has its place where, you know, it's kind of the front line of gentrification. And please use these models, you know, and we hope to kind of provide it in a, um, you know, break, broke, broken down way through curriculum and other website, et cetera, for the film um, to share the model, to hope that others can kind of be inspired or share their models, you know, because obviously this is not like they invented the idea of community process, it just worked in this context. So I think it is really important to, to provide those tools to others dealing with similar issues. It's a part of the whole, a necessary part of the whole. And now that we can, you know, we're seeing it activated, it, it, it makes a big difference. Um, just, just to tag on to that real quick, <clears throat> there has already been a model of the community mural tradition. Um, it started in Chicago in 1967. Um, so that model has already been established and the idea behind that model is to give ownership of the work of art to the community itself. So I think you saw that here uh, in, 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 in the Allen Street mural. What's different now is that that mural is also now being paralleled with equity processes and equity policies and leveraging equity into things like community benefit agreements and policy initiatives that cities are doing. So we're taking an existing model and adapting it for what has to happen in the future, mm -hmm. which is more equity, cultural equity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, art as an equalizer. Um, I'm an equity person. I work in uh, work with the city of Durham around issues. Um, that foster equity in our community. And so um, I saw those aspects of this project. And so it, it's just, just, there were so many things, so many things. I could just go on and on and on. Um, I know the that- mural is actually, a photo of the mural is actually on the city website under the Department of Race and Equity. Really? Yeah. I it's did not know the that. The poster for equity in Oakland, in a sense. Website. Okay, I will take a look. That's that's good to know. Um, what were the things that we didn't see? Like, were there were there some favorite moments, and you knew that those things would not come across? They had to be personal, um, or they were a, a secret between friends, or an understanding because you experienced something together. What were some moments that we didn't see, but were also very impactful for um, for you and this film and the process? 
Well, we didn't get the footage of the developer negotiations, right? Because those were all private. <laughs> so that definitely, that was it's a big true. part of the story. <laughs> I mean, we did interview a couple of the developers involved, but we didn't get into those dialogues, which would have been amazing to include. Golden. <laughs> I can't, I wasn't there, but, you know, Leilan and Eric both were, um, you know, we kind of talk about what happened from those, but um, it could be a story all in itself. And mm -hmm. the other thing I would mention yeah. is, you know, we went deep into so many of the stories of the cultural artists um, at the Malanga Center, uh, Ruth Beckford, this really important figure who's with the center of the mural. Um, was like is really kind of seen as the the godmother of African dance in Oakland. Um, she was a direct uh, kind of descent. Well, studied under Catherine Dunham and taught the Dunham technique back in the '40s and '50s in Oakland. I mean, as one example, and you know, we did so many deep dives into these different artist groups that have been around for a long time and told their entire story and then realized, okay, we can't fit all of this into this, you know, hour long film. Uh, but we do hope to actually produce an Alice Street archive um, that can be a, a, a place where you can learn more of these stories. That'd be one example of something that um, through the process of kind of doing this deep dive, um, we would love to make that available um, to audiences as well. But, um, you know, there's so many side stories and things too that, that you know, didn't make it in the film um, that were very important and felt super important at the moment. And then you have to kind of see how things land and, and how the story needs to be told and, and let go a lot of those things, you know, which is tough to do. Yeah, what I was just gonna say was about you know, the developer negotiations, you know, we just spent hours and hours in, in these meetings. And it really was very deep because you have, you know, mostly white men, not all of them, but mostly white men, wealthy white men coming from, you know, capitalism, coming from, you know, um, capital, coming from outside of Oakland, mostly, um, who were sitting down, you know, yeah, with me and Eric and Carla and, you know, Carolyn and Alvina and all these different people, you know, who were from these communities. And it was just like, I, I wish we had recorded it because <laughs> it was such a deep in interaction between people who, you know, are just seeing the bottom line and just seeing profit and people who have nothing to lose but our communities and our neighborhoods and our sense of belonging right and this direct clash of like capitalism and you know everything that we believe in <laughs> um you know was really deep to help the developers understand why we were fighting for it why we were willing to put our bodies and our lives on the line for it um when again they just thought it was parking lots you know where um we really you know with some of them had very disrespectful interactions you know them just coming in saying oh we're not going to talk to you you don't represent the community you know we're going to talk to the chamber of commerce you know chinatown chamber of commerce they represent the community because they want us here you know um but but also just disrespecting our perspectives you know just you know trying not to negotiate with us so we had to go to the city council yeah and force them to negotiate with us right um but then at the end of the process you know in our fourth community benefit agreement you know over that span of a few years we finally found, you know, a developer who, um, you know, was a little better in the sense of they wanted to do local sourcing. They were really trying to understand where we were coming from. And we wanted them to be a model of like, this is what a good developer can be if you work with the community and we won't fight you. And then they decided not to negotiate with us. So we had to end up fighting them and, and you know, appealing them and, um, and forcing them to the table at the end of the day. But, you know, we actually had this really powerful conversation. I think you were there, you know, where we just, we just, we just sat there for hours and we just said, look, you know, this is what's going on. Um, and we forced them to look at their privilege, you know, and we forced them to have that conversation. And they like had this very touching moment of having to acknowledge their own white privilege <laughs> and they're coming into these communities. And um, yeah, it was, I mean, all those hours will be baked into my memory because, um, yeah, it was pretty deep. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, I can share more. 
but of course that was after the uh, the, the the planning commission hearing where they cried white tears and tried to present themselves as a victim. But yeah, there was like a moment of catharsis and you know that it's interesting because that what we said to the developer was that you're coming into this community, you are now a stakeholder in this community. So you actually have a responsibility to our community, the black arts community, to the Chinese American community of Chinatown, to the people who are already here. And at first they didn't really get it, but three, four years down the line, they're now saying, okay, well, you know, what you've done with uh, the, the community benefit agreement money that you that you secure, the neighborhood level projects that are coming out of this, that is all very positive. Like they're now very encouraging and appreciative of it, where at the very beginning it was it was a very contentious uh, relationship. <laughs> So I, I, I would, you know, if there was a postscript to the to the documentary, it would be like epilogue one, you know, and it would be like us handing out, uh, you know, twenty seven grants for one hundred fifty thousand dollars with uh, money from the, uh, you know, community benefit agreements, and just seeing like how happy the people in the neighborhood are that they're able to do something with that money. Yeah, that is, it, it, it's incredible. And, and it, it, I know it's like when you're a part of something, when you're part of something great and you help to create it and shape it and all that stuff, you know, I, I wonder just, you know, because I asked that question in terms of, do you think it should be repl uh, replicated? And I absolutely think it should, and I'm inspired. Um, it, it, it has to feel really good to be a part of this um, and to be able to provide this, inspiration and education to people through um, such an artistic piece uh, and, and side of a story. Um, I guess we'll, I know we're a little bit after time. It's uh, almost 4.05. So I'll, I'll ask a wrap up question, which is kind of multi, multi-parted. I'm not sure, we'll see. But um, I, so one question I have is um, as a final question would be what question would you want somebody to ask you about this film um, or about this experience and um, and what's left what's left to still be told which is kind of a second part of the last question I asked um, and if there's nothing left then what's next Yeah, you've asked all the great questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Eric shared a little bit about what's next. Yeah, you know, we created this um, anti-displacement fund for the neighborhoods, you know, out of those four uh, community benefits agreements. Well, two of them contributed. Um, and, you know, that set kind of a model for the city um, and, and turning that into a citywide anti-displacement fund, acknowledging um, that that's the norm now. We have, you know, the Oakland A's now negotiating on a stadium and that's kind of, it's one of the asks, it's kind of the norm to say, yes, you have to put into an anti-displacement fund to give the community a resilience, right? It, while you build new development. Um, so I think the fact that, you know, the CBA models and templates that we created are now models for other developments in the city and across the country, we get asked for those templates. Um, I think we need to begin to do that and institutionalize it. You know, we had during that campaign come up with a 10 point plan on how the planning department had to change and how it needed to implement some of the progressive policies from Philadelphia, um, where, you know, communities are embedded in the planning process, where they actually have city staff who go out into the neighborhoods and engage neighborhoods and communities in this, where um, community, community based organizations have a review process of any new developments that are large coming into their own neighborhoods, right? These are progressive policies that need to be spread throughout the country and throughout major cities as this massive displacement happens because we will lose our history and we will lose our communities, and our neighborhoods and our belonging if we allow it to happen. 
And so that to me, you know, is the big push on my end is that we have to have progressive policy. We have to have people who are bold and willing to have these conversations about what we're willing to do to save our neighborhoods and to save our history. Um, you know, because a few years ago, yeah, these, these, these ideas were, you know, they were like, they were too much to ask of developers, right? That was the narrative. Don't ask anything of developers because they won't develop here in Oakland, right? And now, you know, we have some of the highest rents in the country and they don't want to develop here. We can afford to ask for, to be a part of it, right? Um, and so, you know, San Francisco, Chinatown, for example, they have, you know, really strong zoning laws, right? That force um, any developments and offices there to be neighborhood serving, right? Like these are things, you know, that, that was fought in the 70s that were very bold, that were very powerful and that protected the neighborhoods, right? So we have to be willing to, you know, as, as city officials, as policymakers, as organizers, be, be ready and willing and bold to get these policies put into place. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think equity policy is kind of like where this all goes. And Leilan mentioned the uh, Oakland A's Howard Terminal. Uh, process. So I've actually been a part of that uh, steering committee and I just work to develop recommendations around culture and history and having this experience helped ground me in that so that when I came to that table, I could say, well, we need a cultural preservation and stabilization fund and we need a West Oakland History Museum and Cultural Center. And we need to really think about a mural initiative for the Black Arts District in Chinatown. And I've also been part of the um, uh, community advisory group with the downtown Oakland plan, which is Oakland's first area plan to have an equity focus. And so, you know, I went and looked at the municipal code and read the fine print and Oakland has had an equity mandate since 2016. But how is it implemented? And that's where the community pressure you know, really can be that leverage to get these things implemented. I mean, there has been equity policy in a lot of cities, Seattle, Boston, um, other, uh, New York has some progressive language, um, but how is it implemented and does it have teeth? And these are the things that we really need to push for because we're in the right. I mean, we are pushing for things that we should all value as a society, which is diverse culture and recognizing all the contributions that non-white communities have made to a city's identity. For uh, 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 resilience with resistance. And these are the types of things that they're ongoing battles. They're not going, it's not like you get one community benefit agreement and then it, it stops there and there's no more fights to fight there will always be another battle and another fight to fight. And so you just have to like learn from your experiences and reflect the uh, community engagement process that CRP developed that worked on the uh, Alice Street mural. That came out of probably eight to 10 years of developing the process of engagement with community with knowing that, well, we have to give ownership of this piece of art that is going up in a neighborhood to the neighborhood itself. And that's where it all starts. It's like on that ground level, on that, you know, that grassroots, like the ground level. It doesn't start in the ivory tower. It doesn't start in the, you know, 28th floor penthouse. It starts on the ground. And hopefully you get to the table and get to the tower. And when you're there, you say, guess what? We need equity. And maybe Spencer can share too, but we, um, you know, I work in the school district here in Oakland. And so we're, uh, we want to work on with Spencer and Desi and folks uh, curriculum, you know, that um, is taking all this footage of, of the footage that Spencer got of these interviews of, you know, community members, and then turning that into lesson plans, turning it into curriculum for our Oakland public school students to learn our history. Because I grew up, yeah, here in Oakland Unified School District, and we didn't learn anything about Oakland history. History. 
anything. <laughs> we read the textbooks that talked about George Washington and Christopher Columbus, and literally we didn't learn anything about this deep and rich history of our communities and our neighborhoods. And, you know, there's a movement now for ethnic studies and really to transform our textbooks and transform what we're learning in schools that, you know, is actually relevant to our own communities. And also, you know, that just the narrative and the storytelling that empowers us or disempowers us, you know, and I think we're in that moment where people are finally waking up to the history of this country and knowing that the narrative that we've been taught for so long is wrong and it's white supremacist. And so we have to reclaim all of that because that's where it starts. You know, it's the education of our young people to understand their own history, their own power, you know, to, to be able to understand where they fit in, where they belong in this arc of history as human beings on this planet. Um, so, Spencer, I don't know if you want to talk more about that. <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm so glad that you asked the question, uh, Angel, and uh, about what's next. And I'm so glad that Leilan and Eric were here to talk about the work that they're doing because they're really champions for the community and on the front line of that policy work. Um, and yeah, I think um, to bring it back to uh, the film and, the, and, and what's next in terms of the film, um, the, uh, the films just kind of started to get out and really Heitai um, hosting this event is the kicking off um, the next three months of about 10 festivals that we have um, been selected for so far. And we have an impact campaign uh, that's being developed as well, where the films can be brought to communities around the state of California um, and actually in Chicago um, uh, in areas impacted by gentrification. Um, and, you know, this is exactly what we hope in terms of the future is this kind of dialogue and discussion and, um, you know, realizing that the community of Durham and Oakland have um, a lot in common. And there's so much to learn back and forth uh, with um, what's working, you know, in, in different communities. And we hope that, you know, the film can be one more way in which these types of discussions can, can occur and policies can be discussed and strategies can be um, shared. And um, I'm excited about it, you know, and, and for people to stay in touch, you know, please, you know, check us out, alicestreetfilm.com and um, all the other types of links I'm sure will be available. But um, thank you again for the opportunity to talk, hey. talk about these, uh, these topics and, and, and share the film. Does anybody else have any last words or last thoughts? There's so many things I could still say, <laughs> but just know. I just um, wanted to... Yeah, thank you for inviting us to this conversation. Um, I have a, a special love for um, North Carolina. Um, I was actually named after um, someone who was killed in the Greensboro massacre of 1979, um, Sandy Smith. Uh, that's why my middle name is Sandra. And so, you know, she was killed by the KKK. And it's just like, you know, it's just like today. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it's, many, many years later, but um, we're facing the exact same battles, right, about who belongs in this country and who's allowed to have power over it. Um, and so it's just, it's very deep, um, you know, and all of these, these battles are really deeply connected to, to the history of this country. Um, and just, you know, thank you for, for cross, you know, crossing this dialogue um, because, you know, we are all impacted by it. And when we all learn our, our deep histories and how we're interconnected, um, that's how we're gonna move forward as a country, so. Absolutely, it's empowering. Yeah, absolutely. So my final thoughts are, um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna thank you, Angel, for having this discussion and it feels really good to, you know, connect with uh, someone doing equity work across the country. I want to thank uh, Leilan and, and Spencer for also having a, a robust discussion. And my final thoughts just kind of build on to what Leilan said, which is, you know, this seems like a really portentous moment in American history. And this film is coming out right at it, it, you know, a perfect storm time, and that cannot possibly be a coincidence. And so we really have to think about, you know, claiming our own power and not letting them 
other us and disempower us and that it is possible for communities to rise up and fight the power like public enemy said you know like how are a bunch of volunteers you know like a bunch of broke ass volunteers <laughs> going to go up against a rich ass developer and win yeah and win multiple times and actually get something that is you know tangible for their communities out of what would otherwise have been nothing it is possible and it you know it happened in oakland so it can happen in durham it can happen anywhere but you have to believe that you can empower yourself through the process i love it perfect storm and portentous <laughs> yeah spencer so and maybe we did get your final thoughts already but just want to make sure Oh, just Quite again, <laughs> thank you uh, again uh, to Haytai Heritage Film Festival for having us, for having this discussion. It's truly an honor. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad for the connection and I hope for, you know, just more dialogue and, and more opportunities to share back and forth. Yeah, so, I, I just want to say thank you as well. Um, this was such a rich conversation and it was it's such a powerful film. Um, so much so we wanted to make sure that we talked to you all about it and created a, a platform because we're also looking at what it is we're doing with our lives and figuring out how to be the most excellent versions of ourselves. And this is certainly a part that makes up the whole, this film, to be able to tell the stories that you all have told and to be able to convey the messaging um, so profoundly in terms of the shifts, the paradigm shifts um, we're all experiencing. Um, right now. And we're, I think, a lot more comfortable through the process, a difficult process of change because of pieces of art like this. And so art for me, um, in that sense, is a currency. It's more powerful than money. And I think that's why we always run into problems with capitalism, because uh, systems didn't necessarily have money to exchange. Um, they had culture to exchange. And that is again, the most powerful currency there is. And you all helped us see that there, there is a story and, and how we all are part of the whole. So um, an important part of the whole. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to um, be able to market this film, the showing of the film um, in response to the 27th annual Haita Heritage Film Festival happening in February, but this is all new. Um, in terms of the direction the festival is going in and also making such a profound statement in the way that you all did with this film. So um, you definitely serve as our model um, for change. And it's such a, a pleasure to have this conversation with each of you because um, it does help us all to believe that the small things are all, with the small things or the faith of a mustard seed, you can do something really profound and change the world. Y'all have definitely done that. And um, I'm so grateful to have an example to follow. So until next time, y'all. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you.